al Shahristani is a is a strange figure in the sense that his uh, identity is not quite clear up until uh, the, towards the end of his life. So he's generally known as a Sunni Ash'ari theologian rather than an Ismaili figure or somebody who has, has, has had this uh, profound uh, impact on Nizari Ismaili thought. But that will be the subject of, of, of this book and what we're going to talk about today. Thank you. So, second question. Um, how did you come across this text? And uh, how did your work evolve? Because I believe that you worked with the, man with the manuscript uh, for many years. So what, what I would like to know is, how has your work progressed over those years? Now, I've lived and worked with this text for over 30 years now. This is quite a long time. I was almost a teenager when I came across this text. Now, the, my first encounter with the text was a published, edited version of the current text, which was based on a couple of manuscripts at that time by a scholar called Muhammad Reza Jalali Noaini, who was primarily, he was a, he was a lawyer, but his expertise in, in, the, in the Persian literature was basically on the works of al-Shahristan. Now, that text was brought to my attention by a, a, a friend who was a, working for the Ismaili community for the Hitrep in Iran, Olam Zamir Shahi. Now, he gave me the text, and he, read, he was very generous with the kinds of uh, material that he offered me, and it randomly caught my uh, eye. And I started reading the text and trying to decipher what it actually means. And my initial encounter was that I, I did not have that kind of signature on Shah Sunni as an Ismaili scholar. So I was looking at him through the lens of what was already expressed about him as a, a Sunni Ashari theologian, and it just didn't add up. So I was making every effort to reconcile this text with what he is generally known for. And of course, I continued to fail for two decades. Now, at a later stage, <coughs> the engagement with the text uh, uh, took a rather different course. When I started comparing this text, the text of Andres Maktoub, with the extant material of the uh, Ismaili literature from the Alamo period, from the, the Nizali texts. Now, those texts have got certain features which bear a very striking similarity in terms of content, in terms of the language, in terms of the style, with this text. It's as if the people who were writing in the Alamo period, after the death of al Shahristan, had a kind of an example, had a kind of a benchmark when they were producing their literature. It's as if everybody was looking up to him to produce that kind of system of thinking for the Nizali Ismailis. And that, uh, uh, created suspicions. It's not that nobody knew about all these uh, uh, th these speculations about the faith of Shah of, of Shahistani. Everybody was aware of it from the time of his own, uh, of his, during his own lifetime. His contemporaries knew about this. Everybody suspected that there is something off about this guy. That it, so it doesn't look quite so neat to them. It doesn't look quite Ashtani to them. There must be something. And of course, they were finding they were finding similarities between his ideas and the beliefs of Ismailis in general, because of his, his particular interest in rational thinking. They, they would consider it philosophy. And then I started comparing more texts, and then his text on the commentary of the Quran, the uh, tafsir uh, of Shahristani, which is known as Mafati uh, al-Aswar wa Masabi al the keys to young Cain and, and the lights for the virtuous people, which if, if I, I wouldn't want to exaggerate it, but if I really want to put my finger on it, I would call this one, this particular text, the, the text of the commentary of Shahristani and the Quran, as a classical example of exegesis, of Ismaili exegesis, which is very unique. I mean, if you look back at the works of people like Ghazi and Norman in the Fatimid period, the Asas al this comes close to that genre. 
but it is also a tafsir in the classical sense of it as, as a typical average Sunni Muslim could look at it because the tafsir is composed of the ayat and the tafsir and the asrar, which is the esoteric, the ta'wili aspect of the, of, of the text, which is very peculiar, yes, my. So, in recent years, I, I, I managed to look at uh, a, another manuscript, which sort of fixed some of the errors in the first edition, published edition. I, I tried to overcome some of the difficulties which were there in the edit, edited text, and then I re-edited the text and translated this one. This text has been translated into French. There's a French translation of it. Uh, ages ago, I think in the 80s, one of the uh, IS graduates had worked on this text for a for <coughs> dissertation. And again, it was based on the original, uh, on, the, on, the, on the first published version by Jalalina Aini, which was fraught with all kinds of errors. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to make those corrections in the text. It's not really massive, but there are significant corrections in the way that you read the sentences, to read it correctly and to be able to make sense of them, which is how this, this work came to being. It is the result of so many years of, of, of work. It's, it's a relatively small text, but it, it took a very long journey to, 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 to reach where it is now. I can imagine. Um, so it's interesting because uh, you started speaking about this. So you have a whole uh, section in the, in the introduction where you speak about this debate um, so what I want to know is what are the key ideas that are being discussed there and what are you arguing as a scholar? So if you read the text, if you read the published text, I've, uh, in, in, on many occasions I've tried to be as, as careful and as conservative as I would say. In the academia, it's, 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 it's always safe to, to err on the side of caution, to be, to be careful when you make assertions. So you would see that I have been careful with making very, very uh, uh, explicit remarks about the face of Shabbat but uh, everything, every, every, every uh, suggestion that we see in the text points us in the direction that towards the end of his life, mm -hmm. Al Shahdastani was none other than a senior figure in the Ismaili Dada during the Arab period. Now, we, we need to take into account the, 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 the historical location. Al Shahdastani lived uh, 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 around the time of Hassan Sabba, so towards the end of the life of Hassan Sabba, he finishes the text of the Al Milan. Now, he is a contemporary of the first three rulers of Al Mut who were the Dais, who were the representatives of the Imam. But he was also a contemporary of the first Ismaili Imam Hassan al Azikir Salam, the, the one who declares the Riyamat. And uh, when Shahrastani dies, the Ismaili Imam, who is the fourth ruler of Al Amut, is in his teens, in his late teens. He's almost 18, 19 years old. So you see the, the, the impact of the, the generations of, 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 of Dais and, and senior figures who've, who've been there. Now, the thing about his other theological works is that he appears, is this famous treatise, Nahayat uh, al-Adam fi al kalam is known to be a, a theological text on, on Ash'ari kalam. Now, in his other works, he is critical of Ash'ari positions, very vocally critical of Ash'ari uh, positions, particularly in, this, in, the, in the command of creation. Now, there are two texts by Shah Rastani. One of them is the Majlis Maktub. The other one is the Tafsir, is the commentary, in which you find terminology and methodology, which is peculiarly Ismaili, and not the Fatimid version of Ismailis. Mm -hmm. The very specifically Nizali Ismaili tradition, which, which is ushered in after uh, Hassan Sabba uh, reformulates the doctrine of Ta'alim, or the, uh, or the instruction, or the guidance of the present living accessible Imam in order to know God. And that becomes really the cornerstone of the Nizali thought. Now, Shah Rastani plays a very significant role in developing those ideas, in adding more uh, substance to it, in providing a more coherent framework and, and, and methodology to what Hassan Sabba had already formulated in a very uh, uh, summarized form in, in a text which is 
خورد تا چهار فصل و فصول در فرد and incidentally in شهر سانی is the only figure through whom we know of the existence of that text attributed to Hassan Zabba. Because in the Milan, Shahristani offers his Arabic translation of the original Persian text by Hassan Zabba, which is in four chapters, in which he argues for the case of the ta'alim, or the, the instruction, the guidance of the Ismaili Imam. Mm -hmm. So this places Shahristani in the context of, of, a, of, a, of an Ismaili guy. Now, there are many people in his contemporaries who considered him to be an Ismaili, who suspected that he's an Ismaili because of his, the terminology that he used, the language that he chose, because of the kind of uh, esoteric and philosophical approach that he had to matters of fact. But then over centuries, late centuries, he appears to mysteriously fall off the radar. And that could be understood because the Alamut state falls, the Mongols invade, and then towards the end of the, of the uh, and 12th century, the Ismailis go into hiding, and their entire literature disappears. Mm -hmm. It goes into the skies. And it is only in contemporary times, in the early 20th century, that there is a resurrection or resurfacing of an interest in the Ismaili aspects and elements of the life of Shahristani, particularly with works of Jalalina, who was responsible for reintroducing Shahristani into the academia and bringing those attentions. But there's a wide range of positions on the faith of yeah. Shahristani, but the majority of them still point to the direction that he is most probably an Azali Ismaili senior figure. So, okay. Um, what do you think this treatise is telling us um, about the historical context of the time? Shahristani is not a historian per se, other than you could say he's a historian of denominations. But in the indications that we find in the text of the Majlis, we know that there is a, a very serious, uh, active debate going on among the theological schools, the Mutakallamin, mm -hmm. who are really powerful during the era in which Shahristani is writing. Remember, Shahristani is living in the uh, 5th century, 6th uh, century after his time. He's a contemporary of the Alamut state. He's also a contemporary of the uh, Saljuk dynasty. Now, the Saljuk dynasty is, of course, a Turkic uh, Sunni uh, dynasty. And uh, particularly in the, in, the, in the historical period in which he's operating, there, the, there is this powerful presence of uh, Ash'ari thought. The Murja are very active. The Karamiya, which is a particular school of theology, is very active. And of course, philosophers are there. So in a sense, we are, we are still dealing with the golden age of, of his Muslim theological and philosophical ideas. Now, Shah Rastani is critical of philosophers. Now, this is a very important point, because there is this general perception that Ismailis throughout their history have been positively and, uh, and, and openly uh, in favor of philosophy, which is not inaccurate. It's correct, but with, with some caveats. The caveat is that the Ismaili Dawa is not the exactly uh, philosophical kind of work that people like Ibn Sina and Al-Farabi produced. They, they embrace philosophy only in the sense that they, they believe in the balance between faith and intellect from very early on. Now, al Asali is critical of philosophers as you would see this critique of philosophy in the works of, of uh, uh, senior guys like uh, Hamid al-Din al-Kermani, like al mayyad al-Din al-Shirazi, like Hadi al noma And uh, we also know that uh, al-Kermani was critical of the Mu'tazila, who was yet another theological school, uh, uh, which was another theological school very, very powerful during the time that al was writing. And, they were, of course, offering a particular approach to faith. Now, Ismailis were neither theologians or neither the mm -hmm. nor were they, were they philosophers, in pure philosophy, the way that people like Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina engaged with it. And yet, they were not literalist. They believed in the existence of, of an esoteric, deeper meaning to the exoteric, literal uh, wording of the scripture. Mm -hmm. Now, that historical context is not just intellectual, it's also political. Mm 
Okay. Now, the political part of it, this is the historical part which is important. We know that uh, Shah Rastani was in the service of Sultan Sanjar, who was the, uh, one of the uh, uh, Sanjar rulers, who incidentally had a very long period of friendship, so to speak, with the Zari Ismailis. So we have to cut about 20 years of truce between the Zari Ismailis and the Sanjar dynasty during the time of Sanjar. Now, during the entire period when this truce holds, Shah Rastani is in the service of Sanjar. He is a confidant of the Sultan. He is very close to him. And uh, the moment that this truce falls apart, I mean, th this is the part where history becomes a little bit murky. Uh, there is a battle in Ghatwan, and then uh, everything falls apart politically. And uh, there is a dispute again, this, this fight between Sanjar, between the Sanju and the Nizaris Council for. It's during this period that, that Shah Rastani leaves the service of Sanjar. There are a number of political figures, Grand Vizirs of Sanjar, whom we know are Shi'is, who are generally known as Naqibs, and they are known to be as Ismajari uh, Shi'is. But there have been speculations that they might have been secretly as mm -hmm. in the service of Al-Sanjar. There are a lot of speculations that there are people who there were infiltrators in the, in the, in the political apparatus of Al-Sanjar. It extends to people like Shah Rastani as well. Now, this, this part of it is speculation. So once Shah Rastani leaves the service of Sanjar and goes to his own hometown, Shah Rastana, it is the point where these texts, which are more explicit, mm -hmm. are written, are produced, and then they become part of the wider context of the use in the Ismaili intellectual circles. Um, so, um, how does uh, Al Shahrastani contribute uh, towards um, the understanding or deepening the understanding of uh, the Shia Ismaili doctrine of the Imams? Now, we've got two uh, key principles in the, in the Nazari doctrines. The first one, of course, is the doctrine of Ta'alim, yes. which is the instruction of the Imam of the time for, the, for, for knowing God, or to put it very specifically. This is not just a common stereotypical of following the commandment of the Imam in day-to-day -day matters. It's a lot deeper. There is a, the object of that, that Ta'alim is towards the knowledge of God, yes. which is a deeply rooted Shia, Shia idea. But then you've got the doctrine of Qiyamat, which is a declaration of, of, of the spiritual esoteric resurrection, which happens at the time of Hassan al azikir Salam, who is the 23rd Ismaili Imam, the fourth ruler of Muhammad. So when Muhammad al Buzurbami, the third ruler, dies, upon his death, uh, we've got a declaration from uh, the Ismaili Imam saying that those people, now I'm, I'm choosing the words very carefully because we need to look at it with, with equipped eyes. Yes. Throughout history, there have been a lot of misinterpretations and misrepresentations of what happened during the Qiyamat era. And we need to be very careful about these things. So the Ismaili Imam made a declaration that those people, those members of the community, and he made it actually very generous about the people, not just the members of the community, mm -hmm. who have reached the status or the stage of unity with God. He calls this the people of Dwaqat, the people of unison with the Lord, are not required to observe the physical rituals of worship. Now, if you're not careful with it, it's just as if telling you, you really, really don't need to worship. Mm -hmm. But that's not what happened. Because he's not talking about not worshiping, he's talking about the physical rituals only on the condition that you reach that stage. And an allegory would really help us here. And this is an allegory that many Sufis have used. This is an allegory that has been used in the, in the, in the Ismaili context as well. But the allegory is this. If you want to get to the rooftop, you use a ladder. But once you are on the rooftop, you don't bring up the ladder with you and carry it with you because the purpose of the ladder was to take you to the rooftop. If you are there, you no longer need it. The other uh, allegory would be just writing a letter to your beloved. Once you're away from your beloved, you write letters to you. And your beloved receives the letters and reads the letters. But imagine somebody who is in love with, with, with someone, and then uh, you meet that person, 
and then in front of the person you love, you pull out the paper that you've written, the letter that you've written, and you start reciting the letter. It sounds ridiculous. It sounds absurd. So the allegory of the people who are at the state of Wahdat is like the one who has reached his beloved and starts reading from a letter. But lo and behold, this is rare. This doesn't normally happen. Now this is the context where Shah al is important. Shah al played a very significant part in theorizing, in explaining, in elaborating on the conditions of this, of this uh, state of Qiyamat, of this state of uh, spiritual and esoteric union with the Beloved. Mm -hmm. And he explains this through the conversation that happens between Musa and Khif, which is almost one third of the text of the Majlis of Antu. Now, this is a, a, in a sense, a commentary on verses from Surah Al Kahf in the Quran, where Musa, the prophet of God, now he is, he is a great uh, Abrahamic prophet, seeks out a teacher. Remember the idea of Ta'lim concept. So he seeks out a teacher to tell him about the esoteric meanings of faith. So he goes to somebody who is senior to him. He is commanded to go and find somebody who will teach him something. Now in the Quran, the name is not mentioned. It says uh, 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 he's, he's, a, uh, uh, he's a virtuous servant, Abd al Saleh. He's with that, but we know from commentary that he's known as Khidr. Yes. Now, Musa is the man of Sharia, is the man of the exoteric law, is the man of the rituals, is the man of time and space. But Khid is the man of Qiyamat. He is the man of the esoteric realm. He is the man in which time and space are not relevant. They are irrelevant. They are uh, obsolete. So in the world that Musa lives, everything follows time and space. Any reward and punishment is dependent upon actions, on physical actions, on rituals. But in the world of Khid, it doesn't happen like that. So we've got three examples in the encounter between Musa and Khid. In the first one, uh, Khid runs into a, a young child is playing, and then he throws a punch at the child and kills the child. So Musa objects, why on earth did you kill the child? And then he explains that this child is going to grow up and is, become, is going to become a corrupt person, so, and, and the parents of the child are, are uh, you know, faithful people, and it will give them a hard time, so the child dies, and God will give them another child, and they will be happy. So he says, but that has not happened. Hmm? Not yet. And then he, Musa objects to it. And then Chaz tells him, you see, when you started the conversation with me, this was the condition. Do not object to what I'm telling you. Be patient. You will know why I did these things. And of course, he keeps complaining until eventually Chaz says, you know, you're no longer fit to follow. So the, the gist of, of, of the argument of Chaz is this. The world from which I come is a world where all these things have already happened for you. That child has not yet become corrupt. In the world that I am, he is already a corrupt person. And in the two other examples which happens, he does the same thing. Now, this kind of articulation pours into the rest of Ismaili doctrines throughout the other texts that we've got available. So there is a definition of the Shariat and the Qiyamah, of the realm of the Shariat, of the realm of the Qiyamah. And in the realm of the Shariat, you follow time and space. You are bound by time and space. For worship, you give times, you specify times. People pray at a specific time, in the morning, in the evening. People fast at a specific time during a particular month. But in the realm of Yaman, they do not just pray for three, four, or five times a day. They pray 24 hours a day, every single second. It's of a permanent day. state, right? The same applies to the fasting of the Ramazan. The Ramazan is, is allegorically, it turns into an entire year. For the entire year you're fasting, not just in terms of abstaining from eating and drinking. You're fasting from anything which is far from your beloved, which is far from God. 
So it's an exercise in overcoming your own ego all the time, constantly. In this context, time and space is lifted. Now, this was the gist of the doctrine of the Allah. And the terminology which Anasani uses is precisely the same kind of terminology which is adopted by the Anasani's. So there are certain terms uh, that the Ismaili Imam Anasani uses to describe people. People are in one of these three ranks. They either belong to the rank or to the realm of Tazad, which is contradiction, or they belong to the rank of Tarattu, being in different ranks, being in different hierarchies, in grades, people are progressing in their spiritual and intellectual uh, capacity, or they belong to the realm of Wahat. So Tazad, Tarattu, and Wahat. Now, generally speaking, before I want to simplify it without going into any jargons, the people of Tazad are people who do not recognize the Imam of their time, the people who are basically not his minds, not the members of the community. But it's a little broader than that, it's not just in terms of identity. The people who do not recognize the truth in what we're for are the people of Tazad. Now the people of Tarato, in the language of the time of that community, the people who are members of the community, the people who know who their Imam of the time is. And the people of Wadat are the people who are not separate from their beloved who are one and the same with the truth. And these people do not publicize it. They do not shout it from rooftops. They do not pretend. They do not uh, 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 set it out to people. They are silent. The people of Leomad are silent. The people of Leomad are the people who follow the example of Khizr. And Khizr and his example does not typically and normally happen in the world. They are just exceptional rare occasions for a particular purpose of guiding people in the direction. And the purpose is something very simple. Now, this is, this is an interpretation. This is, this is a broad ethical message of Rituals, and these include all the rituals of all faith communities, are meant to teach people something. They are a means to an end. You pray in order to do something, to reach something. You don't pray just to pray for the sake of prayer. You do not fast simply for the sake of fasting. You do not uh, go to Hajj simply for the sake of going to Hajj. You do all of these things in order to get a more ethical person. It's a morality, it's an ethical life, it's critical. And these people, people like Shah Islam, people like the Ismaili Imam, people like Sufis, who happen to be not as not as Bibles, told people that look, the mere act of following these rituals does not make you an ethical person. You can continue to pray three times, five times a day, you can continue to fast, you can continue to do all the things which are prescribed in religion and yet continue to be a deeply unethical person. So the performance of the rituals is not something which turns you into an ethical person. So these guys are basically reminding human beings that beware of, of, of habits. These can turn into habits, and these habits can corrupt you. Always remember that the rituals should be defamiliarized. You always have to encounter them in a fresh way. If you just get used to them, if you just do it as a matter of uh, habits, you will lose touch with the truth of them. So this is the broader context of it. And of course, Shah Sunni is very critical in setting the grounds of it, for the blueprints of it. Incidentally, this, this was the the main reason of how I figured out Shah Rasani to be, according to, in, in my opinion, to be a senior aspiring guy. Because without Shah Rasani, it would be very difficult to figure out exactly what the Ismaili Imam meant. Mm -hmm. If you go back one generation, if you read what Shah Rasani wrote, then suddenly all pieces of the puzzle fall into place. And you really figure out, oh, so this is what the Ismaili Imam meant. He did not mean that. Okay, from now on, everybody becomes anti and Everybody is free to do anything you want to do. That's not what it meant. It's not absolute freedom in whatever you do. It's actually becoming more difficult in observing faith. Being an ethical person is not an easy thing. Performing the rituals is easy. It wouldn't take you more than an hour a day to perform these rituals. But it takes you ages to really become an ethical person. Thank you. Um, so about um, the concepts of uh, um, creation and divine command, um, so these 
uh, treaties elucidates these concepts, but um, how are the concepts being discussed in the treaties? And uh, what's the relationship between these concepts uh, and uh, Shia Ismaili uh, doctrines? Okay, I'll try to be very brief this time, but I think that the last response I was very long. Now, Chalistani dwells on a verse from the Quran, to God belongs the creation and the command. And then it is, it, this, is, this is an elaboration and interpretation of this verse, but it's also deeply connected to two things. First of all, the doctrine of Ta'alim, and secondly, to cosmology. How did the world come into being? This is a key question. This is cosmology. If the, the people who are familiar with the history of Ismaili thought, we know that Ismailis uh, used the language of Neoplatonists, which is very close to the, to the way that philosophers looked at the world in medieval times, which was the language of the science of their times, with Greek, uh, Greek cosmology. So philosophers would tell us that God is the first cause of existence. And then the first effect of that first cause is what philosophers call the universal intellect, or al-kulli. Now, it is then from the first, or the first intellect, al that in a succession of emanations, different apples, different souls come into existence, and then they turn into plants, uh, material bodies, and human beings, etc., etc. This was in the a typical Greek uh, cosmology, understanding of how the world came into being. And of course, a new Platonist victim. So the Ismailis had a serious problem with this one. The problem was this, that in the Ismaili belief, God, or Allah, is beyond any kind of description, beyond any kind of attribution, including creation. And of course, this was a challenge. So you need to put God above all kinds of human speculations, including the way we figure out how creation works. So God cannot be the first cause. There is something else. And that something else is God's command. So God, and this is again coming from another verse of the Quran, it is God's command that when you desire something to come into being, it says, be and then it will be. Mm -hmm. So, to put it in simple terms, God does not really dirty his hands with creation. He delegates that to the command, right? It's God's command, which is the source of all existence. So, imagine the same scenario in philosophers, but put God outside it, and place it at God's command. Now, God's command has a physical, material, expression and manifestation in this world. Mm -hmm. The Ismaili belief tells us that it is the Imam of the time who is the physical, material manifestation of God's command. Not God, God's command. Mm -hmm. Now the Imam, now this, this, this command of God, when it comes into the physical world, becomes at, finds the, the, the form of a creature, and that creature is yes. the Imam. Mm -hmm. It's the body of the Imam. So you could see, in a sense, it's very much close to the image of Christ, Jesus Christ, because if you all one of the other terms which is useful to describe the command is the kalima, is the word, is the yes. logos, if you like. So Jesus Christ is the physical manifestation of God's command on earth. So you see, the, the imam is, in a sense, very akin to the, to, the, to the role of Jesus Christ, because allegorically, esoterically, Jesus Christ is the one who gives life to people. He brings to life the dead. Now, the imam is the medium. The imam, the, the manifestation of God's command, is the one through whose instruction, through his words, the people who lie dead in the graves of their body, whose soul is far from knowledge, who live in ignorance, find the light of truth and find knowledge. So the Imam becomes the resurrected. The Imam becomes Jesus. The Imam is the one who gives life to people. And then this is again in the red in the context of verses from the Quran. There is a verse in the Quran that says, in Namar, Respond positively to the call of God and to the call of his messenger when they call upon you to revive you, to give you life. And of course, this is not, it's very clear yesterday because in Namah, 
you're not dead, physically you're not dead. So if the messenger is talking to you to give you life, this is not physical life. You are already alive physically. This is very clearly a spiritual life. This is the life of knowledge, which is fundamentally different from that. So, have I lost you so far? No. Okay. <laughs> so, that is, that, is the, that is the key direction of, of, of the idea of command and creation. So, Charlestani tries to expand on this, basically telling us that this, this, this man, the figure of the Imam, is a manifestation of God's command. And that is how the world comes into being. And of course, he goes into details of the role of the prophets, of the roles of the angels, of how angels intervene in this. And this, there's something very peculiar about the text, which is odd. In the text, he introduces and represents angels as the forces in nature. So uh, the angel is not just a physical being out there with, with two wings and, and uh, flying and uh, those popular images that we've got. So the rain is an angel, right? The earthquake is an angel, right? and the, the tsunami is an angel. All the good and the bad things which happen in the world are an angel, and they are meant to serve a purpose. And all of these things, the, the prophets, the angels, and then the imams play a part in the growth and the development of human beings on earth. So every individual can reach its, his, his, his own destiny, his, his own ultimate goal. Okay, so but I wanted to ask you, so um, what's, what's, the, what's the place of reason in all of this? Um, you know, because you, you spoke about how the imam becomes the manifestation of God's command. And so, you know, where is reason in, in all of this? Reason is throughout the whole thing, because um, but the fact that the Imam is a manifestation of God's command does not stop anybody from asking any questions, does not stop anybody from having any kind of opinion, nor does it stop anybody from going to the Prophet or to the Imams and say, you know what, I can't figure it out, I don't understand it. Explain it to me. I'm simplifying the responses because it's the, the entire Ismaili history is replete with these kinds of approaches. It means that you have the right to go and ask the Imam. And this is the point where it's no longer taqlid, this is no longer imitation. You don't say, well, uh, you said it and we follow obediently. We don't ask you any questions. Unquestionably, we follow. We don't do this. But then the question is that you could, can you, people sometimes confuse intellectual inquiry with cynicism. This is the major difference between them. The fact that you genuinely have a question, the fact that you cannot figure something out does not mean that you do not have faith. Now, we see this in the engagement between Musa and Khazr. Yes. Now, Khazr knows that Musa is really thirsty to know something. But he is just too rash, he's just yes. too, too, too hasty to really reach that state. So very often tell them, you need to wait. You will get the reason, yes. but you just you need to wait. It doesn't mean that it doesn't make sense, that it's completely unreasonable. Now we see that in the, in the, in the, in the conversations that we find between Abraham, the prophet Abraham, and God in the Quran, that he asks questions, and then God tells him, do you not believe what I'm telling you? He says, yes, I do believe, but I just want assurances. It just doesn't add up. It, it happens on a number of occasions. I mean, Abraham is the, the, the prominent figure, the, the most important Abrahamic figure, who keeps questioning God, who keeps arguing with God, says, you know, I can't accept this. And the Quran actually describes the, the engagement between Abraham and, and, and God as Jadal, as the only case where in the Quran the term Jadal, I mean, Jadal literally means polemics is used positively is in the context of the conversation between Ibrahim and God. He's just really pestering God with, with his questions, and then he gets an answer eventually. So um, my, la my last question for you is, um, what were the challenges that uh, you faced um, in the process of translating these, these treaties? Well, it would be a lie to tell you that I didn't have any challenges. <laughs> uh, there were a few uh, uh, traditions that I needed to, to really uh, uh, find out where the source is. And it would be very difficult to find them. And it, it took me many years to figure out. There's a very specific one, which is, which is about, again, about creation. Now they are, I'll tell you what that is. And this example should suffice to tell you what kind of challenges that I've been facing. 
So the, uh, the tradition in Arabic, it reads like this. Uh, so God created uh, his faith, his religion, according to the template of his creation. So it's not the other way around. It's not creation following religion. It's a creation. And then this works as some kind of a blueprint, some kind yes. of a template. So that people uh, draw conclusions from his creation and reach knowledge of his uh, faith, of his deen, and then through his faith, through his religion, they reach a knowledge of his unity. Now, this tradition is attributed to uh, the Prophet and the Prophet Jafar al the Shia Imam and the Prophet. Now, who are the people who have cited this? The only places that I could really find this out was exclusively in the Ismaili sources. This is not to be found in any other source, whether they are in Sunni sources or they are in Islamic sources. And that was one of my major challenges. Which brings us to the question of whether these hadiths are authentic or not authentic. I think that question is really relevant here because it, it explains something, it explains an idea, it explains a particular methodology in understanding the universe, in understanding the world. So it basically tells you that if you really want to know God, cosmology is important. Knowledge of the physical world in which you live is, is important. Knowledge of your own existence, even your own biology. I mean, Knowledge of medicine is important. So it, it tells us something very, very, at a very basic level, it tells you that there is no contradiction between science and religion. There is no contradiction between faith and intellect. Because this is, this is where it comes back to the question. It is through the vehicle of the same reason, of the same human mind, the same human brain, that you, you should reach the knowledge of God. Now, if your human brain does not lead you, does lead you away from the knowledge of God, it means that you're not doing something right. Now, it doesn't mean that you leave, that you relinquish the requirements of what human intellect does to you, but it means that you need to see it in the proper context. Thank you very much for that. Um, thank you for all of the insights that you provided about the book. Um, I'm certain that you've inspired many of us uh, here to explore these themes further uh, by reading your book. I know that uh, I'm going for a second round. I absolutely love it and uh, love this conversation. And perhaps we can continue this uh, conversation uh, in the future. And um, so I would like to thank everyone too. And uh, Zora. And as we say in Portuguese, muito obrigado. <laughs> Thank you very much.